This is chapter 8, section 1. We're going to, it's broken into two different PowerPoints, A and B. This is part A first. And we're going to talk about signs of a chemical reaction when we get through with chapter 8. We're going to have a lab where you're going to get to identify all four signs of, that are up here for, <laughs> has a chemical reaction taken place. So the first one is evolution of heat and light. The two usually go together. Formation of a gas color change and formation of a precipitate. What is a precipitate? Like a product. A solid. It is a product, but more specifically, it's a solid. It's a solid formed from what? Solid formed when you put what together? Two liquids. Formed from two liquids. Okay? So if you put two liquids together and a solid forms, that solid is called your precipitate. And like I said, when we have this lab at the end of the chapter, after we get through all of this and balancing equations, and then we'll cover five different reaction types, again, you'll get to do all of these reaction types and figure out what's your sign of a chemical reaction. Now, Law of conservation of mass, we've looked at it before. Mass cannot be created or destroyed. We're still talking about ordinary chemical reactions, so that excludes nuclear reactions. And for law of conservation of mass to take place, your total mass has to stay the same from the reactants to the products. And in this example, they're saying if you react 4 grams of hydrogen with 32 grams of oxygen, you will get 36 grams of water. Isn't 4 plus 32, 36? Yes. Yeah. Um, but the only thing that's going to happen in the meantime is your atoms are going to rearrange themselves. So the atoms do rearrange themselves uh, once they react to give you whatever products or pro product being uh, formed. In this case, it's water. Uh, which part is the products? C and D, and then A and B are your reactants. It's important that you know the difference between reactants and products. I'm pretty sure you do, though, at this point. Here are some chemical symbols you're going to need to know because when we get into describing equations, you're going to see all of these. Uh, the arrow that goes to the right, that means to produce or form. That's always what appears between the reactants and products. The plus sign can appear on the reactant side or the product side. Those in parentheses, SLNG, solid, liquid, and gas, it's telling you what phase you have. So anytime you give out um, the reactants or products after the compound, you need to tell what phase it's in. Aqueous also falls into that. It is a liquid phase, but aqueous specifically talks about a solid dissolved in water. So water is the specific solvent. In this case, there are other solvents, but specifically we're talking about something dissolved in water. So the term aqueous is used, and it is in liquid form. And then if you put the triangle above your uh, produces symbol the arrow then that means your reactants are heated in the lab that we had yesterday did we heat our reactants totally we did we used our Bunsen burner so if you were to write down that reaction um, it was magnesium plus oxygen yields so the term I could, you could use the word yields there we would put a triangle over that because you heated it and it produced magnesium oxide what did you find out is supposed to be the true formula for magnesium oxide? MGO. MGO. How did you find that out? Crossover. Crossover charges. In this case, the charges cancel. A 2 plus and a 2 minus cancel. You get MGO. MGO. So that would have went with yesterday's lab. Now, we're going to get into how do you write equations if a formula equation is given. Or if you're given a word description, how do you go backwards and give the formula equation? <coughs> so the example they're given here, we have a formula equation written there in yellow. Hydrogen plus oxygen yields water. 
and you have to identify your substances involved. I just told you, hydrogen and oxygen yield water. What would be the scientific name for water? Hydrogen. That's H. Huh? Dihydrogen oxide. Close. Hydrogen oxide. Nope. Dihydrogen monoxide. Dihydrogen monoxide. Okay? Water is a covalently bonded compound. So you use the prefix system. Hydrogen and oxygen are both nonmetals. So with the prefixes, the dihydrogen part comes from the two right there. It's subscript, and there's one oxygen, so it's monoxide, dihydrogen monoxide. So the first thing you would do is identify the substances involved. Uh, this is H2. Why did we just call it hydrogen? I see two there. Right. It's, a, it's in its diatomic state, so it just takes on the name of the element. The same with oxygen. Next, you would use symbols to show a few things. How many? That's your coefficient. That's what we call a coefficient. So those large numbers out front are called coefficients. The coefficient, coefficients for this equation are 2, 1, 2. Where did I get the 1 from? It's the understood number that would go in front of oxygen, okay? So just like subscripts, we never write the number one as a subscript. You never write a coefficient of one. If the compound or element appears, it means you have at least one of it. If it's written, you've got at least one. You also show of what? The chemical <laughs> formula. So there's your hydrogen, oxygen, and water. And in what state? What does the G stand for? Yeah. Gas. Is it okay that water is in its gaseous phase here? Yeah. If you take hydrogen and oxygen in their gas phase and they form water, it's still in the gas phase. Still in the gas phase. And like I said, remember the diatomic elements. Um, how many diatomic elements do we have all together? Seven. We have seven. So, again, don't forget about those. Now, we're going to start off with um, a word equation first, and we're going to change it into a formula equation. The word equation is given here, and it's trying to remind you, um, based on everything that we looked at, ask yourself this, how many do I have, of what, and they've underlined the of what's, and in what state. So starting off. Let's do the of what. That's the easiest part to do and then go, but you could easily just start from the beginning and keep going. Uh, what's my first reactant that I have? Aluminum. Aluminum. Is aluminum diatomic? No. No, it is not. Okay? So you just write down AL. <laughs> what is my next reactant? Copper 2. Copper 2 chloride. How do you find the formula for copper 2 chloride? No. You know, you know how to do it. Like you and your how? Friend. Well, some of us can do it in our head, but how somebody was going to say it? The crossover. Crossover. It's an ionic compound, so you got to cross over charges. So when I look at copper Roman numeral 2, that CU with the 2 plus charge, where did the 2 plus come from? The Roman numeral. Roman numeral 2. And then chloride is CL, and it has what charge? One. Negative one. So when I cross those over, what is my formula for copper two chloride? CuCl two. Cucl two. Um, it says to produce. There's an arrow. What's my first product? Uh, three out of copper. <laughs> well, copper, right? Um, is copper diatomic? Uh, no. No, it is not. So you just write down Cu. And what's my last product? Aluminum chloride. Aluminum chloride. How are we going to find the formula for it? Crossover. Crossover. Aluminum has what charge? Plus three. Plus Chloride, we said earlier, was a minus one. So what's my formula when you -L -L cross over? ALCL3. Now you can go back and fill in everything else. What are those numbers called that go out in front? Coefficients. coefficients. What coefficient goes in front of aluminum? Two. Two. What goes in front of copper 2 chloride? 3. 
and in front of copper and in front of aluminum chloride. Two. Two. What phase is aluminum in? Solid. Yes. Wait a second. It doesn't say solid. So how do you know it's solid? Because it's on the table. Because it's a metal. It's a metal. It's a metal. And if it doesn't state what phase your stuff is in, you go with its traditional state at room temperature. Aluminum's a metal, which is a solid, at room temperature. Copper 2 chloride, what state is it in? AQ. AQ, aqueous. What about the state of copper? Metal, solid. solid. So, solid again. And the state of aluminum chloride? Aqueous. Aqueous. AQ. So that's how you go from a word description to a formula equation. Who's got a question? What are my coefficients in this example? 2, 3, 3, 2. 2, 3, 3, 2. Can those numbers be reduced to lower whole numbers? No. Nope. So good chance that those are going to be right. Now, before we go back the other way, Let's introduce you to a couple more terms. If you have individual atoms, you call it an atom. So in our previous example, aluminum was individual atoms and copper was individual atoms. If you have a covalently bonded compound, you call those molecules. <laughs> We did not have any molecules in the previous example. But what we did have were some ionic compounds. Aluminum chloride, copper 2 chloride were both ionic, metal and a nonmetal. So they would be referred to as units because they were ionic compounds. So we've got three examples. CO2, is that an individual atom, covalent bond, or ionic bond? CO2. You got to think metals and nonmetals. What's carbon and oxygen? Two nonmetals. Nonmetals. So how's it bonded? Uh, no, it's not, it's covalently. Covalently. So that would be referenced as three molecules of carbon dioxide. And notice they use the prefix system to name it carbon dioxide. Mg, atom molecule or unit? It's not bonded to anything, so it's got to be individual atoms. And then MgO, well, it's not atoms, but is that a covalent or ionic bond? Ionic. ionic. How do you know? Metal and nonmetal. Non so four units of magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide. So let's use this little bit of new information. We're going to take this equation they've given us, and as we describe it using words, we're going to answer... How many, of what, and in what state? Let's go ahead and answer some of this, and then we'll get to what we've got. The how many, those are my coefficients. One, two, one, one. The coefficients, I heard somebody say one, two, one, one. That's good. Of what? What is the name of the very first reactant? Zinc. 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 What's the name of the next reactant? Hydrogen chloride. Hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid. What's the name of the first product? Metal and a nonmetal. Zinc chloride. Zinc chloride. No prefixes. And then what's the name of the last product? Hydrogen. It's just hydrogen. And in what state? You got your solid, aqueous, aqueous, and gas. So you would go through and you would use word descriptions to explain everything we just talked about. One atom of solid zinc, that describes the first reactant. Reacts with. Which part of that is that? Reacts with? Huh? The plus sign. The plus sign. Two molecules of aqueous hydrochloric acid. Why are they using the word molecule there? Because it is a covalent substance. Right. HCl, two nonmetals, is covalently bonded. To produce, which part is that? It's the arrow. The arrow. One unit of aqueous zinc chloride. Why did they use the word unit there? Because it is an ionic, ionic compound, a metal and a nonmetal. Mm -hmm. 
and one molecule of hydrogen gas. Now let me ask this, that very last part, they use the word molecule to explain hydrogen gas. Should that be molecule or atom? It should be atom. I Is it an molecule. individual atom? No. Mm -hmm. It's not. It is two atoms of hydrogen bonded together. So it is actually a compound even though it takes on an elemental name. So it's still molecule. It's two nonmetal atoms bonded together. They just happen to be the same atoms. Any questions on this part? So you're going to have some homework that says describe and write formula equations, all that stuff. So lots of word descriptions going on. Okay, if there aren't any questions, we'll go ahead and go to the second part. So this is considered still Chapter 8, Section 1, but it's going to be Part B, so still part of what Section 1 is. But now we're going to do balancing equations. Pretty short section for this. Here are the steps to balancing equations. We've got five steps. Number one, write the unbalanced equation. Okay, write the unbalanced equation. Now that we have finished Chapter 7, and in Chapter 7 you learned how to write compound formulas, take a name, go to formula, or take a formula, go to a name, but the key there is taking a compound name and coming up with the correct formula. Now that you've learned how to do that, you should be able to take a name that's given and write an unbalanced equation. The second step is counting your atoms on each side. Um, I can probably guarantee I'm going to show you how to balance equations differently than you've learned in the past, but I still think it's pretty easy. I'll teach you how to count atoms. We will add coefficients to make our atom counts equal. So those are the big numbers out front. Notice I didn't say add subscripts, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't so so. Don't add new <laughs> subscripts. Once you come up with the proper formula in step one, you can't change it, but you can change your coefficients. So to get your proper atom counts, if you add a new coefficient, you multiply that times the subscripts that are already there to get your number of atoms. I'll show you how to do that. Now, <clears throat> once you finish with three, uh, you should be finished, but every so often when people are balancing equations, they overbalance, and those coefficients that are out front can be reduced. So you are looking for the lowest whole numbers possible whenever you balance your equations. And then always double check your atom balance. If you're balancing equations and it just seems too hard, You've probably messed up somewhere near the beginning. Go back and start over, um, making sure that you can get the proper number of atoms. Now, those are the steps. Let's give you some tips to remember along the way. Until you get good at this, and some of you will progress very fast compared to others, balance one atom at a time, or one element at a time. Okay? Some of you, some are easy, and it looks like you can do it in your head, and others not so easy, so balance one element at a time. Every time you add a coefficient, update your atom counts. So don't go in and add two coefficients at a time, and then try to do stuff in your head. For now, everything's written on paper. Take it one step at a time. Update atom counts after each coefficient is added. If an element appears more than once per side, balance it last. We have two elements that fall into this third bullet, oxygen and hydrogen. Very common for these two elements to appear multiple times per side, especially oxygen. So if you've got these elements, balance oxygen last, hydrogen next to last. Polyatomic ions. Sometimes you have a polyatomic ion that stays intact. It'll start off as sulfate on one side and it's still sulfate on the product side. If so, put parentheses around it, keep it as a unit, and balance it as a unit instead of trying to break it down into sulfur and oxygen. But you will have other times where you will have a polyatomic ion as a reactant 
but then it breaks apart on the product side, so you will have to break it into its respective elements. So again, if a polyatomic ion stays intact, put parentheses around it, leave it as is. So let's go look at an example, and I will show you how I would prefer you to balance equations. Aluminum and copper 2 chloride react to form copper and aluminum chloride. So they have given us a word description. It's missing a few things. Give me some stuff that it's missing. Coefficients. Definitely coefficients because we're going to balance and determine the coefficients ourselves. And what else? Right, it's physical state. So what phase is it in? Solid, liquid, gas, or so on. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is take what's given and write my unbalanced equation. So what's the symbol for aluminum? AL. AL. What's the symbol for copper 2 chloride? CuCl2. CuCl2. And the symbol for copper? C. And the symbol for aluminum chloride? ALCL3. Okay. So now when I am looking at this, uh, what I want to do is count all of my atoms first. I always do this left to right. You can think about it as splitting your reactants in half from reactants from products. I count up everything on the left and count up everything on the right. Do I have any polyatomic ions here? No. Do I have oxygen or hydrogen? No. So it's going to make it a little bit easier on us, but I've got aluminum, copper, and chlorine. How many aluminum atoms are on the left? One. This is what I'm calling left. That's what I'm calling right. One. How many on the right? Three. Oh, wait, one. Just one. Copper on the left. Uh, one. And on the right. One. And chlorine on the left. Two. Two. And chlorine Three. on the right. Three. 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 Now, here's what I suggest again. Some things are going to be obvious. Some are not. But I always suggest when you start adding coefficients, because that's the next thing to do, because chlorine is not balanced, is when you start adding, stay with low numbers. And I already have some of you that are trying to do stuff in your head. Which side is lowest? Left. Left. So you need to add coefficients on the left side where you see chlorine. And... Is there any number I can put in front of copper 2 chloride to give me three chlorines? That's a whole number. No. So your best thing to do is start with low numbers. It's an understood one already there. You don't write it. So what's the next number we should put? Two. So I'm going to put a two. How many coppers does that make me now? How many chlorine? Four. Now... Now the right side's out of balance. So go back and try to balance the right side. Let's stick with chlorine for now. What coefficient can I put in front of aluminum chloride to try to get my chlorine up to four? Is there any whole number that will give me four? No. No. So start low. There's already one there. What do you want to put next? A uh, two. How many aluminum is that? And how many chlorine? Six. So I suggest again we go back to chlorine, but this time we're going to have to go to the left. And how many or what coefficient can, and you know you need to change this coefficient. I'm just going to mark through it because we're just going to put another number up top. The next place to go would be three because what, what's three times two? Six. So we have six chlorine, but it also changed copper to what? Three. Three. Now we're ready to go back and look at aluminum and copper. At this point, it does not matter which one you decide to do next. Which one do you want to do next? AL. Copper. AL. The left side is too low. What coefficient do I put in front of aluminum on the left? Two. A two. two. 
And what coefficient do I put on the right in front of copper? A three. A three. My atom counts look like they're balanced now. Double check them. But, you know, I'm looking at my coefficients, two, three, three, two. Those can't be reduced to low, lower numbers. Um, probably right, but, again, double check to make sure everything looks good. That's how I go about this. Y'all ready to try one that's a little bit tougher? Of course. Of course. Okay, here's one that we're going to practice with. Um, you'll get to practice with the word problems in your homework tonight, so I'll just go ahead and give you this one. If I said potassium reacts with, what are we going to put down for potassium? Okay, okay. And there's the reacts with. Plus. Is potassium diatomic? No. 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 So potassium reacts with water. What's the formula for water? H2O. 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 <gasps> to yield <laughs> potassium hydroxide. Potassium hydroxide. How do you find the formula for potassium hydroxide? By the crossover method. Crossover. That means you got to know charges. Charge. Wait, what is the potassium hydroxide? Potassium hydroxide. Figure out what it is. Okay. The charges uh, do end up canceling. Yeah, K O H I. Polyatomic ions will not go away. Really? Yeah. Really. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Never go away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's potassium hydroxide, and our last product is hydrogen gas. So what's the formula for that? H2. H2, because it is diatomic. Now, we're going to go and start our atom counts. Do I have any. Polyatomic ions here. Yeah. 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 Hydroxide. Is it still hydroxide on both sides? No. No, so you do have to break it apart. So we're dealing with potassium, oxygen, and hydrogen. Remember, left to right, split that up. How many potassium on the left? One. And on the right? One. Oxygen on the left? One. And on the right? One. Hydrogen on the left? Two. And on the right? Three. Look, I have one hydrogen here plus the two hydrogens there. That makes three. Okay. Now, potassium and oxygen are already balanced, so we need to go to hydrogen. Let me point something out to you because you will have other things that are similar to what we're going to run into here. What is... Uh, could be an issue with this one as far as just simply There's updating coefficients. Yeah. There's two different H's on the product side. What it does is it it gives you more options. Okay? But for right now, um, hydrogen, the left side is too low, so how are we going to try to bump that side up? Coefficient. What number do you want to put in there? Three. Why are y'all jumping over two? two? Okay. Like I said, until you get really good at this, start off low. I could have let you just keep going, but I decided to stop you. How many hydrogen is that? Four. And how many oxygen? Two. Now oxygen and hydrogen are both out of whack. Which one in this case should you try to balance the first? first one. Oxygen or hydrogen? Hydrogen. Really? Even though oxygen it's in two different right. places? Look, you're limited with your oxygen only being in one spot where hydrogen is actually in two different spots. So if you go with your oxygen, better chance that you will solve this without stressing your brain. So let's go to oxygen. How do I get the right side bumped up to two? Put a two there. Put a two where? KOH. So how many potassium do I have? How many oxygen? And how many hydrogen? Look, two times one is two. plus two, two is, four. is four. Okay? 
That's okay. And all you gotta do is put a two in front of the camera. Yeah, so see, we're almost finished. Now I'm looking. Oxygen is balanced. Hydrogen's balanced because I didn't let you go too far off the path. Potassium's the only thing not balanced, and how do y'all want to balance it? Two in front of the K for potassium. Can those coefficients be reduced? Two, 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 one. Can you reduce one to a lower whole number? No. No, that's as low as you can go. So that is correct, two, 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 and one. And you're finished. You don't write anything. Can you write something for one if you want to? No, okay. it is improper. It's kind of like if this is your formula for water, I told you do not put a one right there. It's just kind of the No, it's no. We're going to learn the correct way. And the correct way is do not put subscripts of one. Do not put coefficients of one. If you're, if I have identified my formula here as H2, it's already understood there's one unit or molecule of it there. 